Grace, mercy, peace be to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah, since I didn't plan really to be here this morning, I had not planned a message to share with you this morning. But the thing is, I, I've studied the Bible for a while. And, and one of the things that I, I've looked at is the Christmas story. And I want to share with you just uh, some, some gleanings some uh, insights and some historical perspective in, in regards to Christmas. It's interesting that the early church did not celebrate, did not celebrate Christmas. What was more important for the early church was, of course, our most holy day of them all, Easter, right? Because without Easter, there is no Christmas. That's the reason we worship on Sunday morning. Is because Jesus is risen on Sunday, and we celebrate the resurrection each and every day. Even now, in this Christmas season, today is a celebration of the resurrection. Jesus is alive, and because he lives, we too shall live a new life, those of us who die in, in faith. Uh, but, but Christmas came uh, later. Uh, Christmas wasn't really celebrated until the fourth century. And even then, you know, we, we pick December 25th. Uh, we don't know Jesus birthday. The, the early church didn't put much stock in, in terms of dates like we do and don't recognize birthdays and, and anniversaries. And so we, we actually don't even know when Jesus was born. Uh, it, it is likely probably that he was not born on December 25th because there's 364 other days in the year. Maybe he was, maybe, but probably he wasn't. Uh, a lot of scholars, and again, it's a lot of it's speculation, assume he was probably born in the springtime of the year. And, and why is that? Well, because the shepherds were out in the fields abiding, keeping watch over their flocks. If it had been December, they would have likely been enclosed, you know, in the barns. So that's, uh, that, that's uh, one thing about Christmas. Uh, another thing about uh, Christmas and, and how we count the days and count the, the, the years. Our whole calendar, the Gregorian calendar, right? Uh, we are B.C., before Christ, and then uh, A.D. Uh, stands for, what is it? The in the year of our Lord. It's Latin for year of our Lord, Anno Domino. And so, it would be, it would assume here, well, if Jesus' birthday was December 25th, right? He would be born on December 25th, the year zero. And now we are 221 years later from the, the birth of, of Jesus. But you know what the problem is? King Herod was dead <laughs> in the year, year zero A.D. Jesus was likely born somewhere around 4 to 7 B.C., we don't have the exact year in terms of which Jesus was born, but uh, our whole calendar is in air. <laughs> it, is, uh, it was a calculate. We know more today. The reality of this is we know more today about the history of the birth of Jesus and Jesus' life than people did you know, 400 years ago or even 1,000 years ago. And uh, because of that, we know some things about the calendar that, uh, well, they didn't exactly know. Uh, some other things that uh, sort of trip us up when we, we look at the whole uh, thing of, uh, of, of Christmas. Uh, as uh, Mary and Joseph uh, came to Bethlehem, we, we, uh, we say that uh, we, we know there was no room in what? There was no room in, in the inn. So they come to, to Bethlehem, they, they go to the, the Hampton Inn, they go to the front desk and uh, they say, well, you know, it's all, it's, everyone's all checked. You know, the, there's no more rooms that are available. And of course, uh, the, the innkeeper feels sorry for this, this, this poor couple that, you know, Mary's been riding on a donkey nine months pregnant through the snowstorm. And if you've ever been to uh, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, you realize it, it does snow there, but it is very, very, very infrequent. If Jesus was born, even if Jesus was born in the winter, it is very, very, very likely, it's like less than 1% chance that that first Christmas would have been a white Christmas, okay? So sorry to bust your bubble there. 
Uh, so, so they check into they they they, they can't check into the hotel. The, the innkeeper has uh, you know he, he he feels sad for this this poor couple and takes them around back to the stable. And uh, there they stay in the, the stable with the, with the donkeys and the sheep and all the other animals. Uh, Jesus is born, and they lay him in the hay in, in the manger, right? Well, that's, that's, the, that's, that's the preschool Christmas program, but that's not exactly what happened. So, again, going back to the King James version of the Bible, we know more about Bible translation now than when the King James version was written. And the, 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 the translators for the King James Version uh, used this room, this, this word in. But I have to tell you, Bethlehem was this little tiny town, uh, barely a speck on the map. There was no Hampton Inns, there was no Motel Sixes, and there was no inn in Bethlehem. Remember now, here's, here's the thing. Why did Mary and Joseph go to Bethlehem? Census. Why Bethlehem? Why didn't they go to Jerusalem? Why didn't they go? Why didn't they just have the census in Nazareth? Because Joseph was of the house and lineage of David. David was from, King David was from Bethlehem. So they went to Bethlehem because this was his ancestry. So what does that imply? He's going to his hometown. Who's he going to stay with? Mom and dad. He's going to stay with family. All right? So, this word in can be translated, it can be translated in, but the Greek word there can be translated another way, and the way it can be translated is it can be translated guest room. How ancient houses in Bethlehem, there would have been two stories, and on the top story, there would have been a guest room. And what that tells us is that there were there was a census, people were coming to Bethlehem, just like you know, today, you know. Family has come over, traveled from who knows where, the house is full, <laughs> and people sleep where people have to sleep. And so someone else was in the guest room. There was no room in the guest room. So Mary and Joseph are staying uh, in, in the house. There's no, if you read it, read it very carefully. Where do you see the word stable? We imply there's a stable because, well, reading it 2,000 years later in America, that makes sense, right? If there's a, 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 a feeding trough for animals, it would, it would seem natural that, the, well, the animals stay in the barn. No. Actually, what would happen was the houses that were built usually were just one room. There was the guest room on top, and then there was one room that was where you slept, that was where you cooked, that was your living quarters all in, in one. If you were listening to my Christmas Eve service, I talked about poverty, and they didn't have the houses that we have today. And the thing is, if you leave your animal outside, what's going to happen? Someone's going to take your animal. So you bring your animals into the house. And the, the, the room would typically have two levels. There would be an, an upper level, you know, where it was a step like this. So you'd have a step down, and uh, that, that was where the animals would stay. In the door, they'd come into the door of the house, they'd stay on that lower level, and then you would step up into where the family would live. And of course, if you got, you've got animals in there, you know, we just got a new dog, and we have what? We have our our dog bowl in our kitchen where our dog eats from. And of course, if you have animals in the house now, a, a donkey, you know, a sheep, they're going to need a bigger feeding trough than a dog, so they have the man manger, which was a feeding trough. And that was where they laid the baby Jesus because everyone else was sleeping on the floor, right? You didn't have the mattress stores like we have uh, here today. So you're kind of getting a different picture of what that, that Christmas uh, looked like, a little different than, you know, the Christmas that we have created uh, in, in, in our minds. There, there's a, a number of other things, too, that, we, we, that are common. Uh, there's the, the wise men, right? You have the, the, the shepherds who come and, and visit the baby Jesus, and then there's the, the wise men there as well. They bring their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The truth of the matter is, Wise men came later. Uh, the wise men were not there that 
first Christmas night. Luke chapter 2, it records the coming of the shepherds. Matthew, he records the coming of the wise men. And it talks about, again, where the wise men came to the house where Mary and Joseph were. And then, of course, after the wise men leave, Mary and Joseph flee out of fear of Herod. They flee to, uh, to Egypt. But what was it that brought the wise men to, to Bethlehem in the first place? It was a star. It was a star in the sky. Another interesting thing, there's a lot of theories in terms of what the star was and why it appeared in the sky. Uh, and, and we look at, at uh, astronomy records from the time period, and, and there was a comet. There were, was an adjoining of planets coming together that almost appeared as one star in the sky. Again, we don't know exactly. There, there's a lot of debate in terms of you know, which of these astronomical phenomena was the, the, the Christmas star, or was it something that we don't even really know about? Uh, whatever, regardless uh, of what it is. It was why, why did the wise men know to follow the star? Why, what brought them to Bethlehem? Well, magi was the, they, they were magi, they were Babylonian astronomers, scholars, these were, they weren't kings. You know, we sing the song, We Three Kings of Orient Are. Uh, they, they weren't kings. Uh, we don't even know if there was three, right? You read the text again in, in Matthew, and it doesn't say there were three wise men. They brought three gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but, and we, we attribute one wise man for each gift, but it doesn't say, necessarily say there could have been two wise men. We know it was plural. So there was two, but as far as we know, there could have been a hundred of them, or even more. So they, they come and they bring their gifts of, go, of gold, frankincense, and, and myrrh to the, 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 the baby Jesus. Again, why did they know to come to, well, they went to Jerusalem first. Well, the, the reason was, was because in 586, uh, the city of Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians, and the people of Jerusalem were carried off to exile in Babylon, and they're living among the, the Babylonians. They had their ancient scriptures. The, what we have is the Old Testament today. And there's a prophecy in the book of Numbers by a, a prophet by the name of Balak who was hired to curse. Uh, actually, Balaam was hired by Balak. Uh, Balak was a, a king to curse the Israelite people. And as part of that prophecy, Balaam uh, talks about the morning star that would uh, rise out of, out of uh, Israel, and uh, talking about the coming king. And uh, it was, so the, the, these astronomers, these theologians, these learned scholars had searched the scriptures, they had seen this prophecy, so when the sky appeared in, when the star appeared in the sky, they knew to go to, they knew to go to the people of Israel. So where do they go? Of course, you go, if a, a prince is to be born, where is the prince going to be born? In the castle. <laughs> He's going to be born uh, where the king lives. So they went to King Herod, first of all, and said, where is he born? And of course, then they searched the scriptures. Uh, they're, they're pointed to Bethlehem, and they go, and uh, there they greet the, the baby Jesus. Uh, of course, then they're warned in a dream not to go back, not to go back to, uh, to King Herod. It's all, it's all very fascinating in my mind, you know, having studied the, the history of it, it, it all. And as I, I look to it, a couple points to, to take away. Uh, first of all, it's important when we read the scriptures. Um, there's nothing that, you know, as I've talked about today, there, there's nothing here that changes the fact that Jesus is born in Bethlehem. Maybe it changes our perception a little bit of, of Christmas. But when we read the scriptures, it's important that we read the scriptures with the ears and the eyes of those who originally read it and heard it. It's very easy for us, some 2,000 years later, living in a, on the complete other side of the world, to read it with our modern American eyes and to perceive it as if Jesus were living here among us today. He is here among us today, uh, but to the story as if it happened here among us today. Uh, so when you read the scriptures, you know, ask yourself, what did this mean to those who first heard it? What did it mean to those who first read it? 
And then we take the application and are able to apply it to ourselves. Uh, furthermore, uh, as we, we read the Christmas story, uh, as we read the, the Christmas story, uh, there's a lot to be told. And, and the truth of the matter is, is, is that as much as the story may differ from our perception of the story, Jesus is born. Jesus is born in Bethlehem. Uh, he came as God in the flesh. Uh, born of Mary, conceived of the Holy Spirit, uh, it is a, a miracle of, of God that we receive here today in faith. Uh, you think about the, the, the incarnation. Uh, it boggles the, the mind that how could this be? How can, you know, I can't explain it to you. You can't explain it to me. But we receive God's word in faith. There's so many things uh, with that in terms of our theology, in terms of our belief, things that we can't fully explain, things that we can't fully describe. You know, it is the Lord's Supper. You know, we're not receiving the Lord's Supper. We had not planned to receive that this morning. Uh, but when we come to the table, we receive body and blood in the bread and the wine. Scientifically, you know, I can't explain that to you, how that takes place. But we receive it as God says. We receive it in faith. That Jesus says, this is my body. He says, this is my blood. And so we receive it as that for the forgiveness of our sins. Uh, the life of a believer is a paradox in so many ways when you think about it, uh, because we live in this world, but not of this world. Uh, we can't explain everything. Uh, and one of the things, the temptation of many other denominations, you know, as Lutherans, uh, we grow comfortable with this, living in this, that, that we are a sinner, right? I'm a sinner, but at the same time, I am a saint. Not because of what I have done, but because of what Jesus has done for me. A sinner and a saint at the same time. And we joyfully live in the midst of that paradox. We don't need to fully be able to explain it. Now, many of our other brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, they, they, they try to make sense of it. They, they, they try to explain it. You know, the, for example... Uh, let's take communion again, for example. Uh, some other denominations will teach that when you come to the table here, that what you are receiving, you know, it, it can't be, bread and wine can't be body and blood. So that must not be what Jesus meant when he said that. What he must have meant was that it's a symbol of my body and my blood. So many other denominations, when, when they come, they don't, they don't believe in the true presence of the body and blood of Jesus Christ in this meal. You know, what they see is, is it's just a mere symbol, a representation of Jesus' body and blood, but not, not the same thing. Our Catholic brothers and sisters in Christ, we teach the real presence that it is, you know, when you receive it, it is bread, it is wine, but at the same time, it is body and the blood of Jesus Two things all at the same time. Again, as Lutherans, we're comfortable living in the paradox. Our Catholic brothers and sisters teach that the moment the priest consecrates those elements, we call it transubstantiation, that in that moment, the bread becomes body, and it is no longer bread. The wine becomes blood, and it is no longer wine. Hocus est, from where we get hocus pocus. 
you know, there's a changing, there's a transformation that is taking place. That the, almost that the words of the priest are magic. But we hold dear as Lutherans, it's not the word of pastor, it's not the word of pre, the priest, it is the word of Christ who said, this is, this is my body, this is my blood. We put our faith in God, in Christ, and in Christ alone. Word and sacrament. Word and sacrament. There's a, when it comes to theology, there are, are three different ways uh, theology is interpreted. It, theology is derived. There is uh, history, uh, and there is tradition. Uh, those are two big things uh, that come into play with our theology. Mike was just at our new member orientation a couple of weeks ago. We sat down together, and they talk about adiaphora, right? These are things that are neither commanded nor forbidden. In other words, it's things that we do in the church that are, well, it's not written in the Bible, but we do them anyway. You know, an example of an adiaphora is confirmation. Baptism is a sacrament. Baptism is instituted by Jesus. Jesus says, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And then in eighth grade, they come up in front of the church and are confirmed. No, that's not what the Bible says. Confirmation is a man-made tradition. Now, that's not to say it's a bad thing, but it's not something that is necessarily scriptural. And there are so many things that we do as a church. We were just actually talking, Martha and I were talking before the service was beginning. Uh, Steve was lighting the candles up here. And I was talking, oh, I remember back when I was an acolyte, you know, in eighth grade. And our church, we had seven candles on this side and seven candles on this side. And we were taught as acolytes that we light the top right candle first and you work your way from top right down and then you, you go to the left side and you go from the top left down. And then, you know, when you're extinguishing, you go from the bottom left up and the bottom right up. And that's in, I think that's in the book of Hezekiah chapter 12 verse, no, no. There's no book of Hezekiah, by the way. Uh, but there, there are tr things that become so entrenched uh, in the church uh, that it almost seems like it is from the, the mouth of, of, of God because we've just, we've just done it so, so long. And, and we be, can become to begin to start worshiping the traditions. You can go back to the Christmas story that I was telling you, some of the ways that we perceive the Christmas story. And we begin, you know, worshiping some of the traditions and, and what we call that is traditionalism, you know, uh, that uh, the, the traditions become, you know, you know, the most important thing. But we got to remember what is most important is that Jesus is, is the most important. And so, you know, some churches, you know, tradition, you know, we got to always be able to separate, you know, what is of God and what is of, of man. And if, if what is of man as, as dear as it is to our hearts, as dear as it is to, to what we've known, that we can't, we can't let it surpass that which is of God. If it hinders that which is of God, then we just have to, we have to, we have to let it go. And back in Martin Luther's day, they had this thing called indulgences, right? Instituted by the Pope. And they were selling these indulgences, you know, for the forgiveness of sins and time out of purgatory for relatives that, uh, that were dead. None of this is in the scripture. But it was, part of the, it was part of the tradition of the church and what Martin Luther said, this is not right. This is not what God says. This is what we've come up with. And it's nowhere says this in, in the Bible. We've got to get back to what, what God said. And, and so as Lutherans, it's Scripture alone. We allow the Scriptures to be the basis of our theology. So there, there, there's, there's history and tradition. There is, there is also human reason. And I've talked about that with you know, communion and trying to explain and saying, well, you know, Jesus must not have said that this is my body because it can't really, bread can't really be a body at the same time. So we try to explain you know, the Bible with reason. And Thomas Jefferson was famous for that. Uh, Thomas Jefferson came up with the Jefferson Bible. 
And what the Jefferson Bible was, was he, he, he edited it and took out anything that could not be explained, which basically eliminated three quarters of the Bible. <laughs> Because you got, you know, the, uh, raising a Lazarus from the dead, changing water to wine, uh, all of that got eliminated from Thomas, Thomas Jefferson's Bible, and we just couldn't explain it. Tell you what, I can't explain it all. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of questions when we get to heaven uh, to be able to ask of God. Uh, but we, as Lutherans, again, we live in the paradox. Uh, Jesus, he's God, and he is yet man. He is our Savior, He is our Lord, He is our coming King. And we put our faith in Him and are led by Him and guided by Him according to God's Word, the Scriptures. Heavenly Father, thank You for the Christmas story. Thank You for the gift of Jesus, a Savior born in Bethlehem. Help us, Lord, to look to Your Word. And uh, Lord, there's so many, uh, so many things that sometimes can lead us astray from, from what your word actually says, whether it's our, our own traditions, our own perceptions in our, our culture, uh, and sometimes what other people say. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to see your word at, for what your word says, not what we want it to say, not what we think it says, but Lord, what it actually says, and help us to follow that with all of our heart. Uh, and Lord, where are those places, those things that, that we simply don't understand? In the midst of things we don't understand, a world we don't fully uh, understand. Help give us, uh, Lord, a, a great measure of faith uh, by your Holy Spirit to receive your word, to trust in your word, and be guided by your word each and every day. We pray this in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. Amen.